Hello, and welcome back to chapter two of the Java web development course. In this chapter, we're going to look at servlets, and we'll start creating one to build our first web page. Java servlets are one of the oldest technologies in Java web development. They are at the core of many of the things that we do in Java web development, so it's important to understand them and how to configure them. Therefore, we're going to spend quite a while looking at servlets, and we're also going to be able to pick up a lot of very useful theory along the way. So what is a Java servlet? Well, a servlet allows us to create dynamic web pages. Before we look at them in any kind of detail, I'll briefly describe what a dynamic web page is. Many pages on the web are static, and by static I mean that the page could be written by an author, written just once, and then put onto a web server. Let's have a look at an example. Actually, these days, it's quite hard to find a good example of a static website. More and more websites that are just presenting fixed content that never changes have still been written using software like WordPress or maybe one of the content management systems like Drupal or Joomla. So they're not strictly static sites. But let's take the one that I've got on screen here as an example. This is a website for a small chain of coffee shops in the United Kingdom. They have information on their site about their coffee, their shops, and this information generally doesn't change over time. You could think of this as like a brochure. It's as though they'd printed a detailed advert for the company, but then they'd place that advert online. The material that you can see on this site has presumably been written by some kind of author, and if I was to refresh this page, we would see that nothing would have changed. It would be identical. In fact, I could come back to this page in a couple of weeks' time and I'd expect to see exactly the same thing again. If I click on View Source, we'll just right-click here and choose View Page Source, what we'll see here is some pretty standard HTML. They're using some styling, so there's a CSS file, but there's nothing advanced going on here. So this is what I would call a static page. Now that's fine, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this, and by and large, that's how the web was originally envisaged to be. But for many websites, dynamic web pages are required. By way of an example, I've switched across now to the Virtual Pair Programmers website. On this website, we've got a list of all of our courses on the Browse Courses page, and this list changes over time. We've not built this page. Well, actually, that's not quite true. We've built the structure of this page, but determining which courses appear and when will be based on information that's contained in a database. So this page has been generated dynamically. When we create a new course, then this page automatically gets updated with that course's details. We don't have to go in and change the underlying HTML. Similarly, there's a search box on this page. If I look for a particular search term, let's pretend I'm interested in web services, for example. Here, we've got a page which lists all of the courses which contain the web services topic. There's a few of these, and this list is dynamically generated by the application that controls our website. It looks at all of the information about the courses, decides which ones are relevant, and then gives us the information about those courses on this page. So this page is being generated dynamically. If we view the source for this page, again, what we'll see is some standard HTML with some divs for styling. All of the dynamic work happened on the web server, running actually some Java code. But what gets produced for the browser is just standard HTML. As far as the browser is concerned, it doesn't know that this is a dynamic page, it's just receiving some HTML from the server. So let's understand how the server is able to generate this page. Well, it uses what's called the Servlet API, or Application Programmable Interface. This is a standard library. It's been around now for at least 20 years. And this is what was designed to allow dynamic pages to be written using Java. The general pattern is this. When a browser requests a page from the server via the usual technique, either an address is entered into the browser's bar or a link is clicked on a page, then the request is sent from the browser to the web server in the usual way. 
The big difference then is that instead of a static page being sent back, in other words, an HTML file returned, Java code will run on the server. This code can be anything you like. It could talk to a database, it could calculate some data, it can do anything that you can do in Java. The only requirement is that at the very end of the processing, the last part of our Java code needs to build the HTML page on the fly. And it is this generated page that is then sent back to the user. And that's how dynamically generated web pages work. There's no Java code running on the user's machine at all. As far as the users are concerned, they've received a static piece of HTML. So there's no special requirements on the user's browser. The server could have generated this page using all sorts of different programming languages. We're just choosing Java, but the user will have no knowledge that it's Java that's running on the server. So I think that's enough theory. Let's now go through the steps involved in writing a Java servlet. Now, I've already mentioned on this course that building Java servlets can be hard work. So I've provided a starting workspace for this chapter, and I'd like us to load this up now so we can talk through what I've done here. So I suggest you follow along. In the practicals and code folder that we supply with this course, if you go into starting workspaces and chapter two, there is a project in here called restaurant. We're going to be working with this project throughout most of the course, and it's simulating building a website for a local restaurant. So copy this restaurant folder and place it in your Eclipse workspace. So here's my Eclipse workspace. And as you can see, I've got the restaurant folder there. So now we can go into Eclipse and open up this project. The easiest way I think to do that is click on File, New Java Project. And we just need to make sure we name the project with exactly the same name as that folder, which was Restaurant with a capital R. And if we expand it, we'll find that there's quite a few things in here. Now, this is a Maven project. I'm assuming that you're familiar with Maven, but actually, even if you aren't, you don't need to know any Maven for this course, but do just follow along with me. The first thing we need to do is to get the dependencies for this project. So to do that, we need to open the pom.xml file and then click on the pom.xml tab to get this as an XML file. Now, before we run this file, there is a couple of things I'd like to just point out. Firstly, at the top here, I've listed the Tomcat version that we're using. You might remember I said in the last chapter that this project is going to use an embedded version of the Tomcat web server. At the time of recording this course, Java 9 is about to be released, but it hasn't been yet. Now, I'm assuming that even when it is released, most people are not going to move to Java 9 on day one. And I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that this version of Tomcat 8.0.28 works fine with Java 8 and Java 7 but I can't guarantee it's going to work with Java 9. And of course, by the time you do this course, well, we may be on Java 10 or some future version. So you might need to change this version number. Now, if you do need to do that, I'm going to put a note on the errata for this course, which you'll find on the course page on the Virtual Pair Programmers website. So if there's no errata listed, then it should mean that this version is okay. But do check the errata because if you need to change the Tomcat version number, I will be putting a note there to let you know. So let's assume that that's okay and we'll carry on for now. If you're using Java 8, it's definitely okay. The other thing I want to point out is that the servlet API is not part of the Java SE standard. What this means is that out of the box, you can't build a servlet. You need to add an additional Java library. Now, the embedded Tomcat configuration that we're using gives us this library, so we don't need to do anything else to get started. But if you look down here at the dependencies, you'll see there's a number of items here that all relate to Tomcat. So if you're not using an embedded Tomcat in your own project and you're not using a framework, you will need to go and get the servlet API. That's very easy to obtain. A quick search on any web search engine will find it for you to go and obtain. But we don't need that because I've got all the dependencies here that we will need for this course. 
OK, well, we need to run this POM file so that Eclipse has access to all of those dependencies that we're going to be using. So to do that, we'll right click on the file and choose run as and Maven build. And we need to put something in this goals. Now, if you've not used Maven before, we do have a course on Maven. I would suggest you go and look at that course. But what we need to put in here is simply Eclipse colon Eclipse. And we'll click on run. And what that will do is go away and get all of the dependencies. Now, that was very quick on my machine because I've done this before. But the first time you run this, it might take a little while because it will need to go and download all of the jar files that are needed for this project. OK, so when we've done that, we can refresh our project. And all of the crosses should have disappeared. So that means that our project hopefully will compile. Let's just expand this reference libraries and we'll see these are the different jar files that were needed for the embedded Tomcat. And you'll notice there's one here called Tomcat Servlet API. It's that jar file that we need to be able to build servlets. If we just expand this jar file to have a look at the list of package names, we'll see in here is a number of things that start with Java X dot servlet. If you've not seen packages before that start with Java X, well, that stands for Java extension. There's actually some debate as to why some parts of Java are in Java X dot something as opposed to just Java dot something. But I guess that's what happens when a committee make decisions. Anyway, the point here is that we need these packages, the Java X dot servlet packages and the sub packages referenced in our project if we want to be able to build servlets. If we weren't using an embedded Tomcat, you'd need to make sure you got a jar file that contained these packages. OK, so let's now look at the main part of our project. So in SRC main Java, we've got some code. The first two packages, the data package and the domain package, contain some standard Java. I've written some code for us to use in this chapter just because I want to focus on the web development part and not be writing standard Java code. We'll have a look at this later, but for now, this isn't a prerequisite of any web project. It's just some standard Java code that's going to be useful for us in a few minutes. In the main package, you'll see there's a class called main.java, and this is a runnable class. It's got a public static void main method. Now, I'm not going to talk through what's in here. It's just going to be enough to know that this class will start the embedded Tomcat server with your servlets, when we've written them, ready to be accessed by a browser. Or in other words, we can run this project and that will start the web server for us. If you were building a web project that wasn't using an embedded server, well, you simply wouldn't have this class. The only other thing that's in this project that I want to point out is down here under SRC main web app web inf, you'll see there's a file called web.xml. You might remember when we looked at the structure of a WAR file in the last chapter, we saw that there was a web inf folder with a file called web.xml in it. Well, here it is. Let's open up the web.xml file. Now, I've built this file by hand. If you are starting a new Java web development project, then you would also need to do this. Although, as I said earlier, if you use a framework like Spring Boot, well, this kind of tedious setup work is normally taken care of for you. Right now, this XML file is pretty empty. It just contains a namespace and a couple of attributes which describe our website. As you can see, we'll be building a website for a restaurant in this course called Ricky's Restaurant. The role of the web.xml file is quite important. It tells our application for each URL that the client requests which piece of code within our project needs to run. We'll see this in action in a few minutes as we build our first servlet. But the important thing to note here then is that the web.xml file has to exist, it has to be in the right place within the project, and it has to be in the right format, or our website simply won't work. There are a few other things we can configure in our web.xml file too, and we'll see these later in the course. Actually, there is an alternative way to configure a lot of our project, not using this XML file, but using annotations. 
I am going to cover this a little bit later in the course. But first, I'd like to stick to XML because I think doing this in XML, although it's a bit tedious, it does give us a slightly clearer understanding of how everything fits together. So I think it's better to learn the XML way first and then we'll upgrade to the annotations a little later. So I'm hoping you've been following along, you've got this project up on your computer, and if so, we're ready to start building our first dynamic web page. So the first page we're going to build is going to be a page that welcomes the user. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a Hello World example. It's traditional, it's something we seem to do on almost every course, but never mind because we'll do something to make it dynamic, we'll output the date and time on the page as well as the words hello world. This one requirement alone, the fact we want to output something which is going to be constantly changing, the date and time, makes this a dynamic web page. Now clearly I couldn't write a web page that has the correct date and time in static HTML, so we're going to need some Java to do it. So the first thing to say is that a servlet is just a Java class. What we'll do is write a Java class that will output all of the required HTML, including the current date and time. So this is the general structure of a Java servlet, and they all pretty much look the same. First of all, I'm going to say this again, it is a standard Java class. We can call the class anything we like, but it's considered polite to call it something, something servlet. So in this example, we've put hello world servlet. You should really name your classes with the suffix servlet on the end. So one of the rules of a servlet is it must extend this special class called HTTP servlet. That's a class that comes from the Java servlet API contained within the jar file we saw a few moments ago. Then we write a method. Now actually, there's a couple of different method names we could use here, and I'm going to explain that a little bit later on. But to keep things simple, one option you've got is to write a method called service. This method will run when the user requests a particular page from the browser. We'll be configuring in the WebXML file which URL is going to run this particular service method. I'll show you how to do that when we start coding. But you can think of this service method as the method that's going to generate the page. We don't need to worry just yet about the request and response parameters going into this method, but we will be seeing those as we progress through the course. Let's have a look though at the body of the method. The first two lines of code here are stock code. This is really a cut and paste job. We need some mechanism for sending the page back to the user's browser across the internet. And the way we do that is by writing to an output file. And that's what this first line of code is doing. Print Writer, I don't know if you're familiar with it, is one of the standard output classes from the Java IO library. The Print Writer object is standard Java. It's not part of the servlet API. The second line, response.setContentType, type is part of the web protocol. We have to tell the browser what kind of data we're sending back to it. When you go further with web development, we'll see that this could be XML, it could be a binary stream, it could be a PDF document, it could be all kinds of things. 90% of the time I'd say it's going to be text forward slash HTML. But that's the boring stuff out of the way. We're going to be copying and pasting these two lines of code into almost all the servlets that we write. The next line is programmatically creating the web page. We call this simply by calling the print line method on the out object that we've created. This is not like printing to the console. In a standalone Java program, you're probably familiar with using system out print line. Instead, this is writing to a file which will be transferred to the user's browser. What you put within the print line, well, you're limited by your imagination. I should perhaps just point out that a normal servlet is going to have more than one print line in it. Just to keep things simple on screen, I've only provided the very first one here. As a result, what I'm showing you on screen here isn't great because I've not closed the body and the HTML tags. So just imagine we'll have lots of these out print lines that's going to create the different parts of the web page that we're going to return to the browser. 
Now I'm hoping that you're familiar with some HTML and you'll see all we're doing here is outputting a title in an H1 tag with the phrase hello world. When we come and code this up, we might do a little bit more than that, but there's nothing special going on here. At the very end then, you'll see the last line of code here is out.close. And that will effectively say we have finished the file, it's ready to be sent to the browser. Now, this looks very simple and straightforward, I know. I guess I just want to point out that remember, as well as these out.print lines, you could be doing all sorts of complex Java code in here. You could be retrieving data from a database, running some complex calculations, whatever you like. But the important point is that we are going to use the out.print lines to generate some HTML to send back to the client. OK, well, let's go and build this in Eclipse. And the first thing we want to do then is create a new Java class. So as I said before, we can name the class anything we like, but it's conventional to end the name with servlet. So I think we'll put this as our very first one is hello world servlet, just as we saw on the caption. And I'd like to just do a couple of other things here. First of all, the package, I'd like to put all the servlets in their own package. I think that's good programming architecture. So let's create a new package, which will be com.virtualprogrammers.servlets. And this needs to extend another class, which is the HTTP servlet class. So let's click on browse here and we'll change Java Lang object into HTTP servlet. And you'll notice there's a couple of different versions here. Actually, it doesn't matter which version you pick. So I'm going to choose this one from the Tomcat servlet API. If we use the embedded one, actually, it would work fine as well. And we'll click on finish. OK, so that's the class created. Now let's go and create the method. So it's going to be a public method. It doesn't return anything. The return type is void and we call this method service. The name of the method is quite important. I did say there's some other method names we can use here and we're going to look at those a bit later. But for now, assuming you're copying along, make sure you call the method service. This method takes two parameters. The first is of type HTTP servlet request and we'll call that parameter request. And the second is HTTP servlet response. And we'll call that one response. Now, these two object types will need to be imported. And again, they come from the JavaX servlet package. Actually, it's JavaX servlet HTTP. So let's just import those two. As I say, we'll see what these parameters are a bit later on in the course. We don't need them for this chapter except that we are going to call a couple of methods on the response object. They were in the first two lines, which are the two we're going to copy and paste. So let's go and type them in the first time. So we need an object of type print writer. I normally call this out and we get it by calling the response objects get writer method. We'll need to import print writer. Let's just do that. As you can see, it's from java.io. It's not part of the servlet API. And we'll see that this method might throw an exception. Now, if it does, there is nothing we can do about it. So I think the best thing to do is to add the throws declaration to our method signature. I didn't show you that on the caption just because it's an extra bit of complication, but that's what most people do. Just add that throws IO exception. It shouldn't happen. OK, so the next line then, which is one of these copy and paste lines, is to set the content type. And that's a method of the response object. And we set it to the string, all in lowercase, text forward slash HTML. OK, well, now we're ready to start putting some data into our file, which is going to be transmitted to the browser. So we do that by calling out.println. And we need to put a string in here. Well, let's start with the HTML tag. And what I like to do as I'm building these is create the closing tags at the same time. So on the next line down, let's put in an out print line, the closing HTML tag. OK, well, after HTML, we're going to have a body tag. So we'll have a closing body tag in here as well. 
And then we can start putting in the different parts of the HTML that we want to include within the page. Now, you could do this on multiple lines because it's straightforward. I'm just going to do it within these two lines of code here. So we'll have an H1, which will hopefully display as a nice bold title, which can say hello world. And we'll close the H1 tag there. And then let's put in a paragraph with the time. I think I will do this on another line just to keep things readable. So we're going to input a paragraph and let's put in the closing paragraph tag as well. And we'll put the time is colon. And now I want to do some Java code to get the current time. So let's close our string and we'll put in here, let's append a new date object. I think the format that the dates to string method gets output is absolutely fine for this little example. Obviously, we'll need to import the date object from Java Util. Make sure you pick the version from Java Util, not java.sql. And we'll need a semicolon here to make sure that compiles. That's almost it. The last thing we need is out.close. So I hope you're following along with me that you understand what we've built there. I will just point out that this code is compiling. It's perfectly fine. There is a little yellow squiggly line under the name of the class. And if I hover over that, we'll just say that it wants us to create a serial version UID field. We don't need to do that. That is a noisy warning that you can just ignore. And I'm going to be ignoring those throughout this course, but I might just check from time to time in my problems tag. That's the only thing I have, that noisy serial version UID field. I'm very happy to ignore that warning, but I shouldn't be ignoring any others. Okay, so we've written our servlet. It looks like it's compiling. So the next thing we need to do is decide how we're going to run that servlet. Or in other words, we need to associate it with a URL. I've already said we're going to do that in the web.xml file. I've got on screen here part of what we need to put in our web.xml file. This is the general structure that we use to configure mapping a URL to a servlet. So I'm going to talk through these because it's a little bit verbose actually. The first thing we need is a servlet tag. And in here, we're going to specify which servlet we are talking about. And we do that with the fully qualified package name in an attribute called servlet class. In a second attribute called servlet name, we give our servlet a friendly name. Now, it's traditional that if we'd written a servlet called Hello World Servlet, the servlet name is going to be Hello World Servlet. So it feels like this is a bit of text that we need to write that really isn't doing anything useful. But unfortunately, it is required within the WebXML file. So this first set of tags is giving our servlet class a friendly name, our servlet name. The second part maps the servlet name that we defined above to a URL. Now we can use any valid URL pattern we like here. I've written here a URL that ends in .html. That would look like a static HTML page. It doesn't matter that there's Java running in the background. We could call it anything we like. I think in an earlier version of this course, and certainly on some of our other courses, we use URL patterns that end in things like .do, just to prove the point that this doesn't have to be a .html ending. It can be anything that works as a URL pattern. So these two sets of tags together is telling our application that when a browser visits forward slash some URL dot HTML, it needs to find the servlet with the servlet name my servlet. That's defined up here. Here's the fully qualified package name with the servlet at the end. That's the code that we need to run when the user visits some URL dot HTML. So let's go and put this in our web.xml file in Eclipse. So we'll go to the web.xml file. I'm just going to make this one full screen. And within the web app tags down here, I think where we've got some space, let's start with the servlet tag. And helpfully, Eclipse is going to tell me what the possible tag names are here. So within servlet, we're going to have two tags. The first one is called servlet name. And that's the friendly name we're going to give our servlet. Well, we'll call that hello world servlet. 
And then the servlet class is going to be the fully qualified package name, which for this particular project is com.virtualpairprogrammers.servlets.helloworldservlet. Obviously, it's case sensitive, so make sure you get all of the package name in lowercase and hello world servlet has capitals for the first of each of the words there. OK, so that defines the servlet. The next tag we need is servlet mapping. And once again, we have two tags in here. The servlet name is identical to the one up here. So I'm going to copy and paste that one down here. And the other one we need is the URL pattern. And I think it would be sensible to map this to hello.html. And I'm using a forward slash here at the beginning just to make sure it's always at the root of our application. So if the user goes to hello.html, it should run the code in the hello world servlet. So that should be everything we need to do. Let's make sure everything's saved. And here's the moment of truth. Let's go and test it. Actually, before we do that, I've just realized I've made a very silly mistake. I hope you haven't done the same. I've created the servlet under SRC test Java. It should, of course, be under SRC main Java. So I'm just going to move this servlets package into SRC main Java. I hope you didn't do that when you were following along. If you saw me doing it and you thought you should be doing the same, that was a mistake. It should be under SRC main Java. These aren't test classes. Of course, this is the Java servlet that hopefully is going to be part of our application. OK, so we are genuinely ready to test this now. So we're going to run the main.java class as a standard Java application. And I'm just going to expand the console here and make sure we haven't got any errors. There's some logging information here, but we're going to ignore that. There's no errors, so that looks good. So now we can go to our browser and to access the page, then we'll need to go to HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost, which I'm hoping you know when you do any kind of web development, your local computer is always referred to as localhost. The browser and your computer, I guess, know that localhost means look at the IP address for your machine. Don't go searching over the internet for some server somewhere. And then we need this colon 8080. By default, when we're developing with Tomcat, we run the websites on port 8080. In a production server, you'd normally run on port 80, which means you don't need to supply a port number because that's the standard port number for websites. But while we are developing, we always need a colon 8080. OK, then we can put in the URL for our page, which was forward slash hello dot HTML. And we'll press enter. And it looks like it's worked. We've got hello world and the date and time. If I click on refresh. Well, you can see that the time changed. So we've genuinely got here a dynamic web page. It may be simple, but we've now built our first servlet. Before we leave this chapter, I'm hoping that you're following along and you've got this working. But there are some frequent problems that can occur here. And if you think about it, we've got an awful lot of code that needs to hang together. Most of the problems you're likely to have I would say are going to originate from the web.xml file because you really do need to get this absolutely correct. Say, for example, I'd mistyped the URL pattern. Maybe I've missed one of the letters out of the word hello. Let's now run the application again and see what happens if we try and visit the page with two L's. Now, I should say very important that you stop and start the application every time you make a change. I'm going to show you in a minute what happens if you don't do that. Let's just terminate and we'll restart. And now we'll try and go to the hello.html page. I'll just refresh the page. And we've got here an HTTP status 404. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with HTTP status codes. I'm going to touch on them a little bit later in the course. But 404 is a standard code that means the page wasn't found. So if you've got a 404 error, it may well be that you mistyped the URL in your web.xml. It means that there's no URL pattern tag within a servlet mapping tag that matches hello.html. So if you get a 404 error, that's normally the fix.
Now, as I said, you do need to stop and start your server every time you make a change. If you forget to do that, when we refresh the page, nothing will have changed. If you forget to stop the server and you just try and run it again, I'm going to expand the console here and see what happens. Well, we'll see we've got some nasty looking errors. And the important line is this one here, address already in use. That means that there is another server already running that's using port 8080. So we've managed to create two running instances of our web server, and that's going to cause us some real problems. Now, if you do this, there's a little icon up here which looks like a screen and there's a little drop down next to it. As you can see, when I hover over, it says displayed selected console. Clicking on that lets you swap between the two running applications. So here's our original one. And here's the one that we've just tried to start that didn't work. So if you accidentally do this, the best thing to do is to use that to switch between them, terminate both of them. You can see in that drop down, it says which ones are terminated. So I've now got both terminated and then I can safely rerun my project. I'm just going to refresh that page and check that that's working again. And it is. I'd like to just show you one further problem that could occur because, again, this is a very common error. And I'd like you to be able to deal with it if, as part of doing this course, you find this. Let's suppose when we built the servlet, I'm just going to stop my application running before I carry on. We'd forgotten to extend HTTP servlet. I'm just going to remove that off and we'll save and rerun the application. Now, when we try and visit the web page, we're going to get an HTTP status 500 error. 500 errors tend to be structural problems. In other words, make sure the structure of your class is correct, that it extends HTTP servlet, that you've got the service method correct with the correct parameters and so on. Or it could be something like you've got a null pointer exception in your code when your code ran. Now, helpfully, it does tell us in the stack trace here that the class is not a servlet. That means that we've probably not extended the HTTP servlet class type. So let's put that back. And it should then work again. We'll stop and restart the server. And just check. So hopefully if you get a 404 error, you now know it's to do with the web.xml file. And if you get a 500 error, check to see, have you definitely structured your class correctly by extending the HTTP server class, by getting the service method format correct? And if it isn't that, well, hopefully there's something in the stack trace that gives you a clue, like a null pointer exception or something wrong in your Java code. OK, well, that was a lot of work to get us to the point where we have a working servlet. And in the next chapter, I'm going to set you a task so you get a chance to practice building a servlet from scratch yourself. So have a break if you need one. And then when you're ready, join me in chapter three.